Well, good evening, everybody. Nice to see you. Welcome. Stand there for the Here, am I okay? Stand by now. Stand by now. <laughs> yes, okay. Uh, you know, we're, we're Zooming, of course, as most of you probably know as well. So. Well, welcome. It's really good to see you. I recognize a lot of people out there. I'm Joe Gigarbo. It's nice to see Beth, especially over there. Nice to see you. Um, um, take your mask off when you speak. <laughs> yeah, I know. I'm not going to take my mask off because I don't want to give anybody else permission to do that. Mm -hmm. uh, we want to be more strict about this here, uh, actually, with everything going on out there. But welcome. We've been waiting to do this for a while. We've been working on this for a while to have Jonathan come and speak with us today. Um, we're really uh, glad this is happening. This has been a joint effort between us, uh, the Lancaster Friends Meeting, and the Lancaster Interchurch Peace Witness. Uh, I am a member of the Peace and Social Concerns Committee of the uh, meeting here, and a group of us from the committee are here as well uh, to support the event tonight. So we're really happy to... Uh, to see everybody here. Um, with that, I want to turn it over to Bob Bursch. He wants to say a few words about LITW's involvement. Hello, everybody that, who is here, and hello, everybody who's watching via Zoom. Um, for those of you who are not familiar with Lancaster Inner Church Peace Witness Group, which is what LITW stands for, this was a group that uh, formed when uh, the invasion of Iraq occurred because there was a concern about that war, about the causes of that war, and the justification for that war. Of course, that war brought the attention to the whole Middle East and to the many ongoing perpetual problems that exist in the Middle East. Over the years of its, of its, its existence, LIPW has had a Middle East interest group, a Latin American interest group, uh, we've taken a variety of initi initiatives to address uh, peace issues, <clears throat> but we're also more broadly concerned with justice issues, and one of the things I brought that was dear to my heart to our work is the care of God's creation, the environment. I was on a peacemaking uh, mission trip to uh, Palestine and Israel, and I, it was brought home to me that when there is not justice and there is not peace, the environment gets degraded. And when you look in Palestine and Israel, and you look at that wall, and the implications that it has, not only on human beings, but on all creatures, it is problematic, and it, it raises the uh, level of concern about how to resolve these issues. So I'm very glad that tonight we're going to be able to hear from Jonathan. Jonathan once spoke at one of our events. Beth, his wife, was the president uh, for, of LIPW for a while. Um, last thing I'm going to tell you about is we do have a free will offering. Uh, basically, a large part of LIPW's work is bringing events like this to be and to reach out to the larger community of this area to talk about peace and justice and care of creation. Uh, here, for those of you who are here in person, there's a little basket that is, if you want to leave some money, a check, whatever, uh, that would be greatly appreciated. This is how we fund our work. For those of you at home watching on Zoom, apparently our online credit card donation is not available currently, which explains why we have lost all those millions we would have gotten. <laughs> but if you want to send a check to support LIPW, the address is LIPW Post Office Box 1092, Lancaster, PA 17608. <coughs> last but not least, in a way, this is my farewell. Uh, this is the last event that LIPW is sponsoring. Uh, that I will be a part of. My wife and I are moving to Maine in early February, so I'm going to be relinquishing the uh, presidency. Um, it will be a smoother transition than occurred nationally, I promise you. <laughs> uh, but I did want to thank everybody who has supported LIPW over the years, continue to support this organization. It is a really good organization. We need more voices for these uh, issues in our community. 
So thank you very much. Thank you, Bob. And uh, I need to turn this over to Joe Moore, who's going to be uh, addressing the people on Zoom on how they can go about uh, fully participating in our evening. Uh, we have a lot of people on Zoom, so I'll turn it over to Joe for now. Hi, everybody. I'm Joe Moore. <clears throat> there are 48 of you on Zoom. So let me just give you a few pointers for tonight. Uh, this meeting is being recorded. And so if you would prefer not to have your, uh, your actual picture, it looks like many of you already know how to go down to the, uh, there's a screen that you go on a computer, you go to the bottom left and click on stop video. I'm not, I don't know how to do it if you're on an iPad. you also notice that as you entered, all of you are currently muted. If uh, Jonathan is going to make a presentation that's going to last approximately 20 minutes, and then he's going to open it up to questions and conversation, at that time, if you would use the raise your hand, and the way you do that is that, again, if you're on a computer, you go to the bottom right of your screen and it says reactions. If you click on reactions, it'll say uh, raise your hand. And then you'll do that, and then I'll be able to see you, and then I'll call on you in the order in which you raise your hand. Let me see. Oh, I would, as you can see right now, Joe DeGarbo standing at the podium uh, is just the same size as all of you. So if you want to be able to see the speaker, you can go to speaker view. And you do that, again, on a computer, if you go up to the very top of the... Uh, Green on the right, it says view. If you click on that, you'll have three choices. It'll say gallery view, or it'll say uh, speaker view. And it'll say full screen, which isn't required, but if you want to see, I think, more of the people on Zoom right now. So with that, I'm going to turn it back over to Joe DeGarbo. Thank you, Joe Moore. Uh, Joe and I have been to Palestine, Israel about this many times <laughs> since uh, 2007. And uh, uh, he's, his name is Joe, and I'm the other Joe. <laughs> when we're out there doing our work, that's how we're distinguished among our friends in Palestine and Israel. I'd like to uh, say a few things before, as part of introducing uh, Jonathan to you. Uh, and if you cannot hear me as I speak, I'm going to speak up a little bit more. Let me know, raise your hand, and I'll speak up a little bit more. Okay? Okay. Let's start with it. Um, the purpose of our program tonight is to really continue the dialogue and conversation about how uh, a solution can be found for the long-standing, terrible conflict that's been going on in Palestine and Israel, uh, certainly since, since 1967, but before that as well. So it's just to continue this uh, conversation. Okay. Um, hopefully people know where the you know, bathrooms are here, the, the restrooms are here. And if you need any help, there are some people here who are wearing these. Uh, if you have any questions or need some help with anything, just seek them out and they'll uh, help you uh, with your uh, uh, needs. Um, after Jonathan is uh, finished with his talk, uh, there's going to be a and a uh, for people, and there are, as you see on the end of your benches, there are some cards that you can fill out uh, with the question you may have, or if you feel entitled, uh, you are, of course, to stand up and speak your question, you can do that, as long as it's loud enough. This picks up pretty well. The owl picks up pretty well if you speak up really well. Okay? Uh, if you have a, a question, if you have a question on the card, raise your hand, and one of the people in the uh, with the sign with their name tag, we'll come by and get it, and then we'll make sure to read it out when the time comes. Okay? 
After the presentation is done, we're going to retire to the social room, back this way. Uh, you'll, you'll find that pretty easily. Where Jonathan is going to be uh, seated, set up to uh, sell his books. And uh, there's ways you'll find out how to go about doing that. And uh, I'm sure he'll be willing to sign them for you. And I'm going to have mine signed, I can tell you that. And, uh, and then uh, you can chat. You can chat for a few minutes. Okay? And we'll stay on as long as we need to be here. Okay. Any questions about what, what I've said so far? Okay. Again, it's really good to see you all. Um, um, you know, many people in this room and on Zoom had been to the Middle East, Palestine, Israel before. Many of us. And we've done work there in, in, in promoting peace, nonviolence, and mutual understanding in that part of the world. Uh, and uh, we've also gone to visit the holy sites uh, as well in, in the Holy Land. Um, you go there to support peace and nonviolence. And, and we do this for a, you know, for a long period of time so far. Um, since 2007, Joe and I have been over, my wife Anne has been there as well, to do this work. You can get very discouraged. You can get very discouraged with uh, what you're seeing and what you're, just what you're experiencing out there. Um, and it's easy to lose hope for what's going to happen in the future um, so that we can have peace and mutual understanding and uh, some self-determination for the people of Palestine, but also for security for the people of Israel as well. You know, there's that tar there, that started a, a discussion as well that we want to keep in mind. I've gotten to know Jonathan uh, during my work in Palestine and Israel since 2007. Uh, we have both been members of the Middle East Interest Group, which was referenced earlier, um, which was inspired by Lancaster Interchurch Peace Witness uh, since the early 2000s, 2003 to be exact. Uh, his wife Beth has also been mo most involved with the Middle East Interest Group uh, as well. This journey of, in support of peace, mutual understanding, and self-determination for us and for the good people of Palestine and Israel is long and discouraging. It can be discouraging. Yet we continue this work simply because it's the right thing to do. Simply because it's the right thing to do. It is for this reason that Jonathan Kutab is with us tonight. He's going to be exploring and discussing his book uh, on Beyond, called Beyond the Two-State two Solution uh, to, to explore possibilities that could be Proffered here and elsewhere. A graduate of Messiah College, he has a law practice in Jerusalem. He's a co founder of Nonviolence International, which started in 1989, by the way. He's a board member of the Bethlehem Bible College and president of the board of the Holy Land Trust, which is very active in peace work. He's co founder and board member of Just for Peace Advocates. He was also the head of a legal committee negotiating the Cairo Agreement of 1994 between Israel and the Palestinian Liberation Organization. Not an easy task. Please join me in welcoming Jonathan Kutab. Thank you. I, I will keep my distance and remove my mask so I can project to you. I want to first thank all of you for braving not only the cold weather, but the real dangers of COVID in coming to an in-person event. And uh, from what I see, quite a number of you have been to Israel-Palestine which means that this could be a very interesting discussion uh, of the new ideas that I am uh, proposing. But even for those of you who don't know anything uh, about Israel-Palestine, uh, you, you can understand that there have always been these two forces. The Zionist idea which says that they wanted to create a Jewish state, as Jewish as France is French. 
because God gave us this land, because 2,000 years ago we were here, because we need it, because we are powerful enough to get it, for whatever reason, we want to take this land and make it Jewish. By bringing Jews in, by buying land, and taking land, and by keeping non-Jews out. That's the whole Zionist idea, to create a Jewish state as Jewish as Francis French. By the same token, there was this other idea of Palestinian nationalism, Arab nationalism, that says Palestine Arabiya, Palestine is Arab. What is this nonsense? This land belongs to its population, its original, its indigenous population who are Arab. The majority are Muslims, some are Christians like me, some are even Jewish, but they're all Arab. And we want liberty and we want freedom and we want self-determination like all third world people who wanted to be free. So we wanted a Palestinian state, an Arab Palestinian state. So these two ideas of Palestinian nationalism and Zionism, let's face it, are mutually exclusive. You can't have them both. And every gain by one of them is a loss by the other. Whether it's gain in territory or whether it's a gain in population, uh, through immigration, through birth, through whatever reason, it's a zero-sum solution. So it wasn't at all surprising that these two ideas were clashing. And, and I want to make it clear, I am not saying the two are equivalent in any way, morally, historically, or legally. Because I'm sure people will say, oh, how, how dare you? Uh, this is not a question of uh, two forces that are equal. This is uh, a settler colonial movement that's taking somebody else's land, or this is our land and these people don't exist or don't belong, or they have 22 Arab states, why don't they go elsewhere? So I'm not, I'm not entering into that discussion at all. What I'm saying is that in 1967, something major happened. When Israel captured all of Palestine. And many people of goodwill say, look, this problem can be solved by a two-state solution. Israel should give up the land that it captured in 1967, and in return, the Arabs should give up basically their claim to the rest of Palestine, which is like 78% of Palestine. Mm. For many years, people of goodwill like you, like me, thought that this is the only solution that exists. Divide it into two parts. Uh, that gives each side something, maybe not everything, but it made some sense at the time. So I was one of those who worked very hard for this two-state solution. But then the Zionist movement, I guess, because they are powerful, because they felt they could do it, because they had support from many quarters, uh, started building Jewish settlements all over the occupied territory, exclusively for the Jews. They were not mixed down. They were really totally settlers. Now, under international law, that was considered illegal. Many countries, in fact, all the countries in the world, including the United States, said that these settlements are illegal and shouldn't be there. Until the previous administration, when uh, he who shall not be named, <laughs> decided that it was perfectly okay, they can do whatever they want. Uh, but, but there was really an international consensus that these settlements are illegal and should be removed to give some chance for a two-state solution. Over the years, however, so many settlements were created. 
that it became physically impossible to have a two-state solution. The number of settlers, over 700,000 Jewish settlers. The location of the settlements all over the West Bank. The infrastructure that was created of roads that connected them to each other and to Israel. The psychological and economic integration of these settlements into Israel. created such a reality that you could no longer really talk about a two-state solution with any kind of credibility. Because nobody was going to uproot these settlers. And nobody was going to force them to accept to live as equals, because they wanted to live there as lords and masters of that area. They wanted to be fully Israeli, having all the advantages of being Israeli while still living in it. Plus, part of the Zionist ideal was, hey, this is ours anyway. If these settlements are illegal, then our towns in Israel are also illegal because we took them by force from their owners. So a new reality came about making it impossible to have a two-state solution. Now, if that's true, what do you do? That's where the title of my little book comes in, Beyond the Two-State Solution. Can we think out of the box? Can we create a new paradigm that really addresses the needs of both groups? Again, no attempt at symmetry and no attempt at judgment either. So I said, why do we Palestinians want a state? What does a state do for us? What does having a Palestinian state mean? Why do I want a state as a Palestinian Arab? Well, I want a state so that my identity and culture and language can be respected. Okay. I want a state so that I can be free and have self-determination. Okay. I want a state and a flag and a passport so I can travel, leave and come back and invite people to my state and be able to return to it. Many of us are refugees, most of the Palestinians. I want a state where I can have independence and have control over my life. Now. If you give me something and you call it a state, but that doesn't provide these things, that means nothing. You give me a passport that I can't use because somebody is controlling the border and allows who comes in and who goes out. You give me an airport that I can't use without permission from the Israelis. You give me a par parliament that I can't vote for because if I vote for the wrong people, the Israelis don't accept the results and they put them in jail anyway and they have no authority. To... So what do I want with a state if it doesn't provide what I want? So if you can give me a, a new hybrid state that fulfills my requirements, maybe it doesn't have to be a Palestinian state. It can be both a Palestinian and a Jewish state. Now, it also goes the other way around. Why do you want a Jewish state? I once asked a rabbi, actually, from this area. Why do you want a Jewish state? You're a Zionist, you want a Jewish state, right? Yes. Why do you want a Jewish state? What does a Jewish state do for you? Well, he said, I want a state where any Jew anywhere can go, no questions asked, and be able to defend himself. I said, maybe I can give you something better. How about a state where any Jew, anywhere, anytime, no questions asked, can go and live, where he doesn't need to defend himself because nobody's out to get him? <laughs> so 
why do you want a Jewish state? You want a state where there is a Jewish rhythm to life, where things are closed on Saturday for the Shabbat, where they respect the Jewish holidays, okay? Where you have the right of return, okay? Where any Jew can go and live and be able to be there as of right and be a citizen and a full citizen, okay? Supposing I can give you all those things where the state is Jewish and Arab mm. and not exclusively Jewish. How about that? Can we imagine a new hybrid that is both Jewish and Arab that satisfies the needs of both sides? This was how the idea started for writing this book. Can we create a situation where through structural and constitutional arrangements we can guarantee that both sides have everything they want except for exclusivity? It can be a Jewish state but not exclusively Jewish. It can be an Arab state, but not exclusively Arab. Because I tell my Palestinian friends, look, you can't say Palestine Arabiya when half the people in that state are not Arab. Mm. And they're going nowhere. Mm -hmm. And I tell my Zionist Jewish friends, it can't be a Jewish state if half the people in that state are not Jews. Mm. And they're not going anywhere either. So un unless you want to, con to have a, an openly apartheid state where you call it Jewish and where Arabs basically have no rights or few rights and where the Arabs are fragmented and kept in different enclaves with different systems applying to them, but where the real power resides with only with the Jews, Can we create a state that meets the needs of both people? I think we can. And I think it will be a better state than either an Arab state like all the other Arab states or a Jewish state that's really cut off from Jewish morality and values. And that is basically an apartheid state that's an old settler colonial regime, which is anachronistic and out of date. Yes. Well, what are the objections? What are the objections? Mm -hmm. In this book, I, I talk about what are the objections. And I try to address them. And in fact, I am pleased to meet with a group like you who are knowledgeable enough to maybe question me and ask me and bring your own objections. One of the first objections, obviously, is the whole issue of demography. If this state is going to be democratic, it matters who has the majority, right? But I explain in the book that democracy is not based only on demography. 51% <laughs> of the population do not have the right to disenfranchise, to step over, to ignore, to oppress, to deny or demonize the others. A genuine democracy allows for individual rights and for the rights of substantial minorities to be respected. Like in the United States, people are discovering elections aren't everything. You have all sorts of other problems here, <laughs> including the Electoral College and others. But apart from that, in no democracy can you ignore substantial minorities under your rubric. You have to provide constitutional guarantees sufficient. And, and South Africa is a perfect example where when you got rid of apartheid, 
whites continued to live and thrive and in some cases dominate certain sectors even in a democratic society. When you look at the United States, there are minorities, including Jews, by the way, who thrive and prosper and even dominate certain sectors beyond their numbers. So democracy doesn't mean the dictatorship of 51% especially if the Constitution provides for mechanisms that ensure the rights of minorities. So we have to get rid of this demographic demon. That was one of the objections. Another objection, of course, is what about security? I hear that from Israelis all the time. After our experience with anti-Semitism for two millennia, mostly in, of course, the Christian world, not in the Arab Muslim world. And certainly after the Holocaust, we can't rely on anybody but ourselves. Security is essential to us. So in my little book, I provide at least two answers to this argument. First, I said, what happens if we make the defense minister, the head of the army, navy, uh, air force, and nuclear weapons, which nobody acknowledges, will always be a Jewish person with an Arab deputy. But the head of the police force will always be an Arab Palestinian with a Jewish deputy. This way you can be sure in terms of the broader picture that you can be defended and secure from any outside uh, enemies, but the Palestinians can be sure that genuine equality will be maintained and there will be no oppression. In addition, I say we need a special department. 10% of the security of the defense budget should go to a special department mm -hmm. whose job it is to teach mutual understanding of the culture and the language of each other and to have joint programs because the real danger to the security of Jews in Israel today doesn't come from Iran or Turkey or Saudi Arabia or Jordan or Egypt. It comes from the Palestinian people. It comes from a 12-year-old schoolgirl with a pair of scissors in her pocket who doesn't care about anything and who feels frustrated and who feels she needs to stab somebody. And the way you deal with that is to deal with the issues of injustice and to create mutual understanding. Now, I know people's hearts cannot be changed, but we can work on programs that remove the sting of oppression and the feeling of injustice, that provides some relative justice, that provides for a system of reparation and reintegration of people into the life of the country, that provides for some measure of restorative justice, even though it's not absolute uh, justice. So, <clears throat> This way you can provide a lot more security to Israeli Jews than you would by giving them uh, another squadron of F-16 <laughs> airplanes or tanks or submarines or uh, bunker busting bombs, which is I think the next thing that they want to, to, uh, to, to give to Israel so that they can dig very, very deep and blow up very, very, very much as if that is going to provide them with security, which it doesn't. Now, there may be other objections, and I would like to hear from this audience, but one, one of the objections I always get is, are you being too idealistic? Mm -hmm. Are you being too utopian? And I say, yes, of course I am. <laughs> I have a vision 
of peace. I had a vision of justice. And nothing happens unless you have a vision. If people have no vision, they lose, they despair, and they die. We need a vision. But it's a vision of peace. And it's a vision of security. And it's a vision of a better life. I also provide some other uh, interesting features for this hybrid uh, state, uh, including, uh, believe it or not, uh, civil law for marriages, divorces, and personal status. Because in Israel today, you really don't have religious freedom. Unless maybe if you are an ultra-Orthodox Jew, maybe. Because the rabbinical courts for Jews have total authority over personal status matters. Reformed Jews don't and conservative Jews don't. And secular people really don't. And for Christians, there's only 10 denominations that are recognized. And if you're not from one of these 10 denominations, you really have a hard time. And it's really very difficult for you to even inherit or register property in your name and pass it on to your children. And if you happen to fall in love with somebody from another religion, you are in trouble with both communities, religious communities, as well as with the law. Because there is no civil law to provide for you. And if you happen to be born into one of these religions, but you don't want to be oppressed by your religious courts, whether they're Sharia courts or rabbinical courts or ecclesiastical courts, which more often than not are very discriminatory, especially against the rights of women. What if you don't believe in God? Or you want to get out of it? You're not allowed by law. So, in the hybrid state that I propose, there will be more freedom for individual people. Jews as well as Palestinian Arabs of different denominations that exist today. So, there can be some very positive things that come out of a one-state solution that is genuinely democratic, that recognizes the rights, including the right of return for Palestinian refugees, of all people, Jews and Palestinian Arabs, but which also tries to recognize and deal with the fears and the hopes of both people. Now, there will be people who will not like the solution on both sides who want to stick to their ideology, whether it's Zionism or Palestinian Arab nationalism. And they will simply deem their people to eternal strife. But I think for the majority of people, we can satisfy their needs in a new state. That's a hybrid. That's Jewish and Arab. That's fully Palestinian, Arab, but also fully Israeli, Jewish. And that requires some painful adjustments for Palestinians and for Zionist Jews. But it is something that is doable, and it's something that people can really work towards. This is, in essence, what I am proposing. And I'd like, for those who have read the book, I see some of you already have the book. It's a small book, and it's very concise, I think. It even has a summary at the end, a few pages, <laughs> for those who don't have the time or patience to read the entire book. Uh, but I think it is a good idea, and I would like for people to start thinking about it. Because the two-state solution today not only is not happening, but it's also becoming an alibi to avoid 
dealing with mm. the really serious problem mm. that continue to exist. I think I've used up the time that is allotted to me, and now we can move into the more fun part of the evening and see about your questions and your comments. And as well as those that are on YouTube. As well as those who are uh, on Zoom, you can either lift your hand or put the question in the Zoom box, in the, in the question box. Are you finding few or many people in Israel and Palestine who are beginning to give credence to this idea? The book has been translated into Arabic and Hebrew. It has not been published yet. It will be published within the coming few weeks. We've already asked the printer to start printing them, and so I'll be distributing them. The few people who have heard my ideas have been intrigued. A lot of them have been skeptical about the possibility of implementing it, but I haven't heard anybody who really opposed it. Uh, I think people are saying, is this really doable? How can you convince? Israelis to accept this idea. But uh, I think it will be harder for the Israelis to accept it uh, because they are the powerful party. They are the privileged party. And people don't usually give up their privileges easily. Uh, you can talk till you're blue in the face to slave owners about how slavery is terrible, but eventually there needs to be some powerful forces internal and external to end slavery or apartheid or colonialism or other forms of oppression? Well, actually, that's my stupid question. I, I can't see the government of Israel ever agreeing to this. And I, I understand that the majority view in Israel is becoming uh, less open to negotiation. So w what would be the first step to politically to start talking about it? Well, I think, I think that there are two obstacles on the Israeli side for any peace. Uh, the first obstacle is the imbalance of power. We have all the power. Why should we? Why should we give up? Even if we talk about a two-state solution, why should we give up Judea and Samaria? Why should we dismantle any settlements? Why should we share Jerusalem? Why should we make any kind of gestures or recognition towards the Palestinians? So we have to do something about that imbalance of power. We have to bring some pressure to bear. Uh, and, and unfortunately, the United States has been doing the opposite. It has been preventing any kind of balance from coming into the picture. Preventing the United Nations, for example, or the International Criminal Court, or anybody to change the balance of power. Uh, the whole the question about Iran is not because they're afraid that Iran is going to attack Israel, but that Iran, if it acquires nuclear weapons, will have a little bit kind of balance. And they don't want balance. They want Israel to continue to be totally in. So that's one obstacle. The second obstacle is what I call the Holocaust syndrome. The fact that I know the Israelis often misuse and abuse the, the Holocaust to justify things. But there is a real fear. People have gone through genocide. And therefore, in a sense, they don't trust anybody or anything. Even movement towards peace, they become even more scared. Oh, look, they're getting smart now. They're talking peace. They're no longer threatening us. They're talking peace, so that's, we have to be even doubly afraid uh, of them. So we have to deal with the, the, that Holocaust syndrome, and we have to deal with the balance of power if, if we are going to make any uh, progress towards peace, a just peace, uh, not just my ideas. Uh, I applaud your cogent and visionary presentation. 
uh, surely your grandchildren will get to see it. But it's going to take a long time, isn't it? And I'm going to be asking you, I have uh, an item of information I want to give to the group. My question will be how we get from where we are now to where you want to be, given the shameful, uh, violent, and oppressive occupation of the um, Israeli military occupation installed by the Israeli parliament or Knesset in 1967. I wrote a, my master's thesis about the origins of the Palestine-Israel conflict and the relationship between Palestine and Jordan 50 years ago. So I'm seeing things in a historical perspective. And then after that, I worked in Lebanon, Egypt, Jordan, West Bank, and or traveled there managing emergency relief and development projects. So I have a pretty clear impression about how deeply entrenched these issues are. Uh, what I have, I have five copies of an article that appeared in the New York Review of Books, December 2, written by your wonderful colleague, Raja Shahaza, in which he describes, uh, explains how the Israeli government has considered, has classified your organization in Jerusalem, al haq as a terrorist organization, along with five other human rights organizations. So my question to you is, how should a group like this um, address this established system that has been so entrenched now for over half a century? Um, my complaint about this gathering, LIPW, and the people who gather in these peace assemblies is that we're so eager to make peace that we neglect and turn a blind eye to the daily dehumanizing violent oppression by the Israeli military government. We should all be angry at what has been happening for more than half a century. We should do more than just having pleasant talks together. We could do things like sending a letter of support to Betty McCullough, a, a, a Minnesota congresswoman who in October wrote a, uh, wrote a uh, statement or appealed to the House of Representatives to give support uh, to, or to, pardon me, to condemn the uh, Israeli action of uh, naming al haq and the, these uh, six human rights organizations as um, as terrorist groups. So your colleague in Jerusalem now faces the prospect of being classified as a terrorist. So my question is, I know it's, it's not acceptable to have such a long uh, prelude to the, uh, uh, to the to my question. I'm surprised Joe didn't interrupt me. <laughs> but but I want to I want to know how do we get how do we get to where you're going? given these deeply entrenched realities. Okay. Uh, Urban Peach is obviously very well versed in this uh, problem. Uh, but, but you're asking two separate questions, I think. The first is, what are the practical steps that can be taken? And the second is, how long will it take? Is it a question of generations or decades or years before we can achieve something? And I'll, I'll start with the second one. And I will say that as a student of history, we know that there are certain things that cannot stay forever, that have carry within themselves the contradictions, uh, that they are against the movement of history. 
And when I speak to groups, I usually try to remind them that 100 years ago, women didn't even have the vote in this country. A little over 100 years ago, black people were bought and sold as chattel in this country. Mm -hmm. So if you take a historical perspective, what's happening in the state of Israel is such an anachronism, mm -hmm. so totally against the movement of history, so totally different in a, in a world that today accepts human rights, accepts the idea of equality, not only abhors apartheid, but has classified it as a crime as an international crime against humanity and as a crime of war, which gives jurisdiction to the international criminal courts as well as to other courts under universal jurisdiction. So it's, from the point of view of history, and I would say also from the point of view of anybody who believes in God, what's taking place there is not something that is going to last for very long. And when the collapse comes, I think it will come very, very quickly. Because right now, it is very much a system that is based on ignoring reality. Where the United States has created this bubble, this umbrella, that allows Israelis to live as if the rest of the world doesn't exist. As if international public opinion doesn't matter. As if, as long as you get the United States or the top 10, 1% on your side, you can ignore the rest of the world. As long as you can get a few Arab leaders, all of them undemocratic, all of them not representing their countries, and you can bribe them with some arms deal, you can ignore the Arab world as well. You can ignore the Muslim world, and you can ignore Europe as long as you get the top 1% giving you all sorts of trade rights and trade uh, agreements. Uh, this type of vulnerable situation, I think, is ahistorical. And it will end very quickly and very dramatically, but we don't know when. We don't know how, and we don't know when, but we know, just like apartheid in South Africa. Mm -hmm. South Africa was more powerful militarily than all the African continent put together. They had a lot more resources than Israel today has. And they did have the support of the Western governments and elites until the last year or two, and the big corporations until the last year or two were all supporting the apartheid regime. And then it collapsed very quickly and very dramatically, as did the, the, the wall, the Berlin Wall mm -hmm. and the Soviet Union, as did some well-known uh, regimes in the Arab world and elsewhere that collapsed overnight. Uh, nobody expected them to collapse very quickly. <laughs> we saw Afghanistan, how quickly that regime collapsed even though they had more soldiers and more equipment than the Taliban. Mm. They, they, they collapsed almost immediately when, when, when the US uh, support was withdrawn. And it, wa it was going to be withdrawn, and everybody knew that, that that was going to happen. So on the issue of when it will happen, I don't know when and I don't know uh, how. On the issue of what needs to happen between now and then, mm. Now, that is a very, very good question. When I wrote this book, I, 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 I wrote it more as an intellectual exercise. This is the vision. How to get there is another book. <laughs> but then I realized that everybody that I talked to wanted to hear, how do you get there? <laughs> so I have a small chapter there, a few pages, where I uh, mention specific things that can be done. Mm. Specific issues that need to be addressed between now and then. For example, we need to lift the siege of Gaza. Makes mm -hmm. no sense mm -hmm. from a security point 
of view, totally immoral, totally mm -hmm. inhuman and inhumane. Mm -hmm. Keep two million people totally under constant surveillance and a constant regime where nothing can go in or out without yeah. permission from the Israelis. Mm -hmm. It's just intolerable. It has to be lifted. We can do things like stop using military courts for children, for minors. Oh, no. That's bigger view. Don't have to. It's not earth shaking, but it's huge. Stop using administrative detention. There's 500 people now in jail for no reason other than that Israel decides I want them in jail for hmm. six months, which are renewable. Many of them are on hunger strikes. The, the, the last one was for over 100 days on hunger strike, saying, "Tell me what I did wrong." bring me to court, even to a military court. Mm -hmm. Give me some charges. How can a society run 50 years now mm -hmm. when anybody can be arrested anytime mm -hmm. for no reason, for secret evidence? This declaration that six organizations, including Al-Haq, which I helped uh, found, are, are, are now terrorist organizations. You can call anybody a terrorist organization. Uh, and and uh, they have the power to do it. And they can arrest anybody who belongs to or even gives public support for such an organization. Just expression of public support for it is a criminal offense and you can be taken to, to jail and put on trial, etc. Mm. So the, the current situation is totally intolerable and we should do something about it. And if mm. the government doesn't do enough, to bring Israel to heal, to force Israel to accept international law, then that is where the church and the students and the unions and civil society starts acting up. That's why BDS movement, boycotts, divestment, and sanctions, which is a nonviolent movement, all it says is we, we must stop investing in a, a regime that's oppressive. That's divestment. Mm -hmm. We must boycott corporations that help this regime to, to oppress people. Mm -hmm. We must put sanctions on people who openly and clearly violate international law, including declared U.S. policy. Mm -hmm. Israel is so worried about that. And they use their influence to get even states over 30 states to pass legislation, which is clearly un unconstitutional. That if you support BDS, in fact, you are required to sign a declaration that you don't support BDS. I know this uh, one Arkansas newspaper said, you know, it's a small newspaper. It's like uh, the Lancaster uh, uh, paper. And, and they have to sign a declaration that they will not boycott Israel or any uh, territories that Israel controls. Otherwise, they won't have any uh, dealings with the state and they lose all their advertisements. He says, I never thought about boycotting Israel until the state told me you can't do it. I'm an American. This is a constitutional right. Who can tell me what to do and what not to do? See, because Israel is worried that the issue here is not security. The issue here is power and domination. And the issue here is morality and ethics and law. And so they want to criminalize anybody who calls them for their criminal actions. So what we need to do, there's a lot that needs to be done. And there are a lot of good people in this country what we call PEPs, for progressive except for Palestine. And they're progressive on every possible issue, but when it comes to Palestine, uh, they, 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 they don't want to uh, do anything. Yes, we have, a, we, have a couple, uh, we have some people that have been waiting. Yes, please. Uh, there's two or three questions on the, uh, on the chat room, and then one person, Mark, has a hand up. Mark, I'm going to take a couple of these written ones first, and then we'll get to you. Uh, one question, how does your idea address the settlements? Yes. Uh, 
My idea treats the settlements like it treats all the Arab property that was taken from the Arabs in Israel itself. We won't take anybody out of their homes, even if they are illegal and even if they've stolen their homes. But we will provide for the owner of that home or that land or that property. We will provide for them compensation and alternative houses from the public domain. Uh, because you can't create a just solution by creating a lot of suffering and displacement. That's why you can't remove 700,000 Jewish settlers, even though they're illegal, even though they're living on somebody else's land, and uh, you can't do it. Physically, you can't. So you say, okay, you stay in your house, but we will provide other land and other housing for people. Because these settlements, you know, the Israeli right wing always likes to point out mm -hmm. that if these settlements are illegal, then the Israeli towns and cities are also illegal mm -hmm. because they were taken from the Arabs and, and, and their owners sometimes still have the keys to their actual houses. So we're not calling on removing anybody from where they are but we are removing their, their privileges, they will have to live with equality. They have to live under the same conditions as everybody else. Mm -hmm. But we will not force anybody out of their homes. Okay, the next question is also written. Do you have any documents oh, yeah, I'm now never gonna get in. Damn it. prior to the release of the book? Use of even trying. <laughs> I could have written a, uh, a, a big, thick doctoral thesis about uh, the idea of a one-state solution throughout the ages when people suggested that a long time ago, when Palestinians suggested it, when they rejected the partition resolution. Uh, but, but I thought it was better to... You know, the, the Palestinians, the, the PLO and the Palestinian National Movement for a while accepted the idea of equality and, and of a single secular state, democratic state in all of Palestine. But we were told, Shh, shut up. If you say that, it means you don't accept a Jewish state. You are calling for the destruction of Israel. Don't talk about a secular democratic state. Let's talk about two-state solution. But now that the two-state solution is no longer available, uh, I think there is more interest in the one-state uh, mm -hmm. paradigm. Mm. And, and, and the, the, the only thing that I did, I think, which is new, is try and do it in a positive way mm -hmm. that addresses the interests of both sides rather than say, it's only fair to have equality and when we have 51%, we'll show you we will be the, the powerful ones. There's uh, two or three more questions written, but Mark has had his hand up for quite a while. Mark, how about you unmute yourself and speak to us? That okay, me? thank you very much. Um, I think you do raise some very- I'm hearing you. Do you hear me? Oh, sorry, Mark. Um, is the volume up on your computer? Um, I believe so. I'm sorry, Mark, can you hear me? Yes, I can. We're not able to hear you. Maybe you could put it in the chat. Put it, yeah, write, write your question. I'm sorry. For some reason, I'm not getting your volume. Okay. Is that any better? So, so one another written question is, uh, who in history came the closest Jesus. to accomplishing a two-state solution? I always thought that President Clinton and the Y River Talks was close to solutions. Yes? Well, it depends on who you're talking to. There are some people who say there was never, ever any realistic offer from the Israeli side for a two-state solution. Uh, they would not show you the, the maps. They will say, we give you back 96% of the land, but which 4% do you want to retain? 
And is it one piece or is it scattered throughout the area? Uh, it seemed at certain points that maybe we are close, but always at the last minute you throw in a monkey wrench or you throw in a, uh, a condition that you know the other side will not accept. Uh, in fact, Shamir, one of the very right-wing people, he says, eh, I can keep these negotiations going for 10 years. <laughs> They're going nowhere. Yeah. He then realized that they were going to go on for another 20 years, not 10 years. And they're still, even today, when you come up with anything that's positive, they tell you, oh, this is not helpful. Give the peace process a chance. I, and we know now there is no peace process. Mm -hmm. So there, we must think radically and out of the box. Mm -hmm. Can I jump in here? Uh, let's finish. Uh, is there another question, Joe? Okay. Two or three more. Yeah, take a, take a couple more. We're, we're running a little late. Okay. Uh, but we wanted to try to, to try to keep the answers a little shorter okay. so we can get to the other questions. All right. Okay. Uh, the next one. Do you have relationships with any of the Jewish and or joint Jewish Arab organizations that are working against the Israeli occupation as a way to engender dialogue of your ideas within Israel? Yes, uh, I do. There's Jeff Helper, there's the One Democratic State uh, group, there's uh, Rabbis for Human Rights, there's uh, Breaking the Silence, there's some very good, uh, very brave Israeli voices that, that that give one hope. The, the, the follow-up is, uh, our company was asked to sign such a document. I assume you might be talking about the... Anti-BDS. Yeah. Jonathan? People are telling me they could hear Mark. Why can't I? <laughs> I don't know. Uh, <coughs> your solution is predicated on trust, which does not exist when one side does not accept the existence of the other side. Mark. Similar no. to our hopeless inactive action on indigenous. No, my solution. Oh, sorry, let me just <laughs> I'm not great without a mouse. <laughs> okay. um, similar, similar to our inactive indigenous population having numerous agreements changed to their detriment. That's it. Yeah, the yeah that, that that is one of the arguments that I've heard that your your solution is based on documents, on constitutions, on laws, on agreements which uh, people will tear up when they're not in their interests. Uh, in a sense, that's true because I'm a lawyer. Uh, I, I believe in, in agreements and written agreements uh, that, that clearly specify where things are. Uh, but it's also based on the fact that both Palestinians and Israelis love the idea of the rule of law. They love to have courts and constitutions if they are respected. Uh, I think that this solution, if it happens, is not going to be based on trust. It's going to be based on a change in the power relationship with a lot of outside powers saying, this is what has been agreed to, we will guarantee it, we will make sure. Because both the Palestinians and the Israelis depend on the outside world. We cannot survive for a second without outside support. The area is too small. This is not China. This is not India. This is not even South Africa with, with huge amounts of natural resources. These are two really tiny pieces of the world that are totally, completely dependent, economically, militarily, politically, culturally, food-wise, uh, uh, fuel-wise, uh, in every sense of the word, we are dependent on the rest of the world. 
So if other countries around us realize that this is the way to solve the problem and are willing to guarantee uh, this peace agreement, of course, both sides have to agree to it, then, then I think it stands a good chance of being accepted. Not because of trust, but because a clearly written agreement that provides justice, that addresses the needs of people, uh, and that's not forced on them, uh, but, but that, that really addresses what they want. Patient yeah. Mark, yeah, I couldn't hear. Yeah. Heard. Uh, no, both sides have to accept that the other side is allowed to exist. Yeah. That is not the current situation. Isn't it right. That is correct. Yeah. And, and I think that's where I started. Okay. I started by acknowledging that Zionism at its roots mm -hmm. totally denies the even the existence, there's a land without the people. There's no such thing as a Palestinian people. They're, they're a made-up country. And the Palestinians have said, what Zionism, what Jewish people, Jews, Judaism is a religion we respect, but what do these people coming from here, there, and everywhere? They have no legitimacy, no right to be here. Yes, at root, I, I acknowledge that these two uh, movements do not accept each other. Mm. Maybe what they need what, what the Palestinians need is recognition of their rights, and what the Israelis need is some legitimacy to what they have acquired and what they have become. So yes, there needs to be mutual acceptance, which doesn't exist today. I think we've come to the end of our program. I want to hear Bob, ha Bob Hannum's question. Um, there's another question that I have some thoughts too, I mean, maybe we can talk about that um, with, the, with the grassroots movement, for example, the movement at that <coughs> level, there is not a grassroots uh, movement idea necessarily. Thank you. Uh, how are the grassroots, yeah. how, how can they support <laughs> you, uh, your vision? Um, and, um, you know, how other alternatives to the two-state solution are being talked about and discussed, because there are more, more than one uh, paradigm out there that people have uh, been discussing. I've got a minute to address either of those questions and then we'll stop. You know, Can we hear questions. Bob Hannum's question? Uh, uh, the, the grassroots, I think, are very important because <laughs> Israel has succeeded in quashing the Palestinian leadership and making it subservient to its needs. So it's, today it's regular Palestinians who are you know, in Sheikh Jarrah, in Jerusalem, yeah. it was ordinary people, not the Palestinian Authority, that, that, that mm -hmm. we, in some of these villages, uh, like Beit and others, no, how the hell you get in? To the wall. Even in Gaza, the Great March of Return was really grassroots. It wasn't Hamas that, that, that mm -hmm. uh, guided it. Uh, and, and the Palestinian people are, 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 a, are a very strange people. They don't, they don't accept. The, the, the reality that they've been beaten and beaten and beaten and beaten again. <laughs> that they continue to say, no, <laughs> we're still here, we exist, we, 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 we survive, we resist. Uh, even when their own leaders uh, have, have given up the fight, yes. ordinary people haven't. Hey, Jonathan. Thank you. Thank you. And which I pro you probably mentioned in your flyers, that, that you can download the book uh, mm -hmm. for free from the internet, from the Nonviolence Center. And there are a few books available in the back. If, if you want to uh, buy one, uh, hard copy, some people like hard copy. Uh, there's also the, the article that uh, Urban mentioned. Uh, He's kindly brought some copies of it. I have three copies left. He's <laughs> already given away two, and he can give away the other three. Joe, there will, I'm sorry. There's, somebody has asked twice if we could allow uh, Bob Hannum to speak. Can you hear me? Uh, I hope that we're going to be able to hear you, Bob, but... Can time. you hear me now? Bob is a very active member of the Middle East Interest I'm group. sorry, the audio is not working, Bob. I'm sorry. Oh. Can you hear me now? Are you muted? No.
Bob, you are muted now, but others can hear you apparently, though they the moderator can't. How do I get to the moderator? I would say just ask your question, and then if you want to type it into the chat room as well. Nonviolence International is the site. Just Google search Nonviolence International. That's a question, and I'll type it in for you. Get to All right. right. What kind? What kind of reaction is he getting from people that he's talking to now, both there and here, about his ideas? We hear him. We can hear Bob. Okay, Jonathan. Jonathan. What is going on? Oh, I can't hear you, Bob. Ask your question. Okay. <laughs> and, and it's Bob Hannum, Jonathan. Hi, Bob and, Bob and Peggy. Hey, what kind, of, what kind of reaction are you getting from people that you talk to, both there and here, about your ideas? Well, generally very positive. Uh, people like the idea, but they are uh, they think it's a bit idealistic, and they're uh, always asking questions about its implementation. Uh, but nobody has really challenged it in any to say that it's wrong or that it's not uh, workable. Uh, mm. uh, that's generally the reaction I am getting. Okay. Uh, Tom Getman has worked very hard to get the book into the hands and into the offices of about uh, 80 senators now. And then he wants to- Oh, wow, all right. His office, Tom Getman has been doing a wonderful job in trying to get it in the hands of uh, Congress people who are influential. That's good news. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so we'll uh, nice sign off. On. We're going to go back to the uh, social room. Uh, I'll, I'll lead and then we can follow. Okay. <laughs>